Well, I suppose we'll go ahead and get, get started. So first of all, um, thanks a lot for coming out on a, on a beautiful evening. Um, I'm not really sure what to say about the weather, except for we probably shouldn't talk about it, and maybe it'll just stay like this for weeks and weeks. Um, but move this up. So this is the second installment of the Evening at Egan Lecture Series. If you weren't here last week for Terry Tempest Williams, you missed out. Um, but I want to make sure that you don't miss out on the next two weeks. Um, I have the titles here. Next week, we have a guest from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, it's Bill Schneider, who's an anthropologist and the curator of the oral history collection at the Rasmussen Library. Um, he's here in conjunction with a, with a project going on on campus entitled the One Book, One Campus Project. We're all reading um, a book entitled Listening is an Act of Love, and he's here to talk about stories from statehood um, and stories just about Alaskans by Alaskans that are collected at the UAF library. His title is The Way We Remember It, Personal Stories from Alaskans About Their History, which I think it'll be an exciting evening. And the, weekend, the week after that, these are all at Friday at 7 p.m., um, our own Jonathan Anderson uh, is giving a provocative talk entitled, Juno's Government, Should We Throw It Out and Start Over? <laughs> uh, <laughs> should be good. Jonathan, as you know, is uh, um, on the assembly, the CBJ assembly, and he also teaches in the School of Management here at UAS. Is that right? The School of Public Administration, rather, excuse me. But my primary purpose here is not to, not to pitch the series, but rather to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Forrest Wagner here, um, who will then in turn introduce um, my friends and colleagues and also former students sitting in the front row who were part of this, this great trip. So for those of you who don't know Forrest, he's the program director of UAS's Outdoor Studies program. Um, he's an assistant professor of Outdoor Studies as of this year, a, a title that we're all excited for Forrest to have. Um, he is a lifelong Alaskan. He's a graduate of the program, in fact the Outdoor Studies program that's been around now for about 10 years. He's been more or less running it since 2006. Um, and he is concurrently also doing a, a graduate degree at UAF in Northern Studies and is thinking about these issues and, and not just from the perspective of uh, an employee who runs a very successful program, but as a kind of intellectual thinker as well. Um, and in his spare time, as we'll see here, he climbs mountains and he's been doing that uh, professionally in the summers as well. So turn it over to Forrest here, um, but please join me in welcoming Forrest as well as the uh, Outdoor Studies Program. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. Hello to all. Those here tonight, those watching on Alaska television, and those tuning in on UATV, which is streaming live right now on the internet. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> I consider it an honor and a privilege to stand you before you tonight as the moderator of this forum, the second evening of Egan for the fall of 2010. I'm both the instructor, friend, and student of many of you, and of the good people sitting in the front row, my co-presenters of Climbing Denali, my expedition members. And if those members could please rise one at a time, we'll start with Sammy Becker. Freddie Munoz, yeah. Yosuke Sano, yeah. and Shay Mack. Yeah. And we have a few members not here tonight. I'd like to acknowledge them. They also will be heard. Travis Haskin, Acacia Edmiston, and Professor Kevin Krein.
As the junior member of our academic community at the University of Alaska Southeast, I want to acknowledge the administration, uh, Chancellor John Pugh, retired provost Robbie Stell, and then acting dean James Everett for their support of the outdoor studies climb of Denali. I also want to acknowledge the support of the humanities department and of the chair of that group, Jane Tursus. Also, Margaret Ray, the administrative manager of arts and sciences, and of Virginia Berg, our administrative assistant. These people made this possible in a big way. A few people in my life des deserve mention specifically in regard to the subject. My parents, Marjorie and Joseph Wagner, Stan Justice of Fairbanks, Yasik Maselko of Juno, and Caitlin Palmer and Colby Coombs of Talkeetna. Thank you. My interest in climbing Denali began as a small child. I felt a calling to climb mountains, to climb Denali. Present on clear days from the hills of Fairbanks, my hometown, Denali, and other peaks of the Alaska Range loom distant, massive, omnipresent, even when covered by clouds or nightfall. Denali remains a life goal and a life achievement for me. Thank you. It's part of a larger thread that continues to inform my time spent on that mountain, on other mountains, and in all wild places. Part of me, a very quiet, triumphant part, is still in the mountains, still touching a glory that remains tangible but fleeting. Another part of me, less quiet, yearns to return. A, finer, a final part, perhaps most clearly represented now as the person moderating this forum, accepts that the modern world will allow me to live here with you and also understand when I return to that other place, the one I would mostly prefer to be. I suppose one could call this living in two worlds as much a contradiction as a lifestyle. Outdoor studies at the University of Alaska Southeast is an interdisciplinary experience. Housed in the humanities department, we incorporate outdoor skills with various offerings in the liberal arts. Our goal is to train competent and confident outdoor leaders, but also, and perhaps more importantly, to empower and inspire through challenge and adversity the qualities of the mind that are the, the broad learning outcomes of any university curriculum. Experiential learning, learning by doing, an action period followed by a reflection period is a standard model for our program. And one that allows for very real and accessible qualities in our coursework and in our students. Most of these qualities, soft skills like group dynamics and communication are hard skills, excuse me, or hard skills like rock climbing, sea kayaking, or mountaineering are mostly means, not ends. Ultimately, our program aims to inspire quality experiences that will allow participants the opportunity to develop judgment, a skill not easily taught and to feel empowered to interact in, of, and with the world as leaders, as civic-minded citizens, and as individuals with the appropriate tools to engage questions and situations critically while also preserving a sense of humility and a sense of wonder. What follows is a compilation of voices from the Outdoor Studies graduating class of 2010. Those speaking have earned a certificate in outdoor skills and leadership, a degree from the university only earned after completion of a capstone experience, a one to four week expedition following nine months of intensive academic 
and skills coursework. The, 2000, the 2010 group, most of which are sitting before you now, chose to climb Denali for their capstone, why you're here, the most ambitious goal to date. En route for 19 days, traveling for an additional two on each side, the Denali capstone was a significant endeavor. And the efforts of the 2010 cohort deserve every ounce of the recognition they received for their efforts. Rather than present to you the normative slideshow experience, one that most Alaskans have seen multiple times, our goal tonight through the use of slides and first person narrative is to tease out the human element in the 2010 capstone. To understand climbing Denali, not just as a goal or as a trophy on the wall, but as an adventure into the unknown. In this effort, we have attempted to capture the emotion the physical, mental, and environmental challenges, the uncertainty. With any human narrative, if that narrative is worth anything, comes a certain amount of intimacy. I thank you in advance for your respect and attention to the people who will present tonight. Most will tell you in their own words and in their own way that this experience, this Denali capstone, changed their life. As the moderator, I will introduce the members of the expedition. Each will share their individual voice, and in the background we will show slides relevant to the speaker and their high point on the route. We will also hear from two members of the expedition via audio recording who could not attend tonight. Briefly, the mountain and our route. From Bill Shermanitz, Complete Guide. Denali is one of the world's greatest climbing challenges. It is among the world's tallest mountains when measured from base to top. Its great height, combined with its subarctic location, makes it one of the coldest mountains on Earth, if not the coldest. Halfway to the summit, Denali's climate equals that of the North Pole in severity. Even in June, nighttime temperatures on its upper slopes may reach minus 30 to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. In winter, temperatures to minus 75 degrees Fahrenheit have been documented with wind chills to below minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Quoting Phil Brees, noted geologist of the National Park Service, Denali National Park, and taken from Colby Coombe's seminal West Buttress. It is often said that the great challenge of Denali is not the climbing, but the weather. Denali is a subarctic mountain located in the middle of the southern Alaskan mainland at about 63 degrees north latitude, which is 35 degrees north, or approximately 2,400 miles north of Everest. This is the same latitude as northern Hudson Bay, and central Scandinavia. Denali's northern location means that the climate around its summit presents one of the most severe year-round averages of any spot on Earth. Denali's west buttress, the standard route and the one we took, is by far the most popular route on the mountain. For the purposes of our discussion tonight, I will keep my comments on the west buttress relatively short. The slides that will soon follow and the narrative of my expedition members will speak more powerfully than my words. But a few facts at this juncture may help you understand the scope of our efforts. Roughly 17 miles from beginning to summit, the West Buttress Route begins after a 60 mile flight from Talkeetna, Alaska, elevation 350 feet. and it begins on the southeast fork of the Kahitna gr Glacier, elevation 7,200 feet. So you fly in 60 miles, land on a spur of the major Kahitna Valley Glacier, and then we describe it as the lower mountain. From base camp, where average loads are 145, uh, 120 to 145 pounds per person, distributed between pack and sled, 
The route travels up the Calhitna for approximately 10 miles, gaining elevation slowly at first and then more steadily to 11,000 feet. During this initial section, teams traveling on snowshoes or skis are the norm, and the main and very manageable hazard is crevasse fall. From the 11,000 foot camp, from the 11,000 foot camp, climbers don crampons and ascend up sections of often very icy, glaciated hills, progressing over almost two miles toward Windy Corner at 13,500 feet. Windy Corner is considered the lower crux of the route. After the corner, climbers advance approximately one mile to Basin Camp at 14,200 feet, the advanced base camp for the West Buttress. The Upper Mountain. The section from Basin Camp the high camp offers technical and beautiful climbing. Climbers ascend out of the Janae Basin to the base of the headwall, where 800 feet of fixed lines set by the National Park Service and the guiding concessions allow for safety and help efficiently manage the human element of traveling up the 40 to 55 degree ice and snow slope. At the top of the fixed lines, which establish climbers on the west buttress proper, the route then follows a stunning and exposed granite ridge to high camp at 17,200 feet. From high camp, climbers ascend about a mile, over 1,000 feet to Denali Pass. The route then continues for almost two miles on the summit plateau. A final summit day hurdle, climbers must ascend the quarter mile summit ridge beautiful and exposed to reach at 20,320 feet, the true summit of Denali. My purpose with this short route description is not to belabor the logistics of a climb on Denali, but to share that an expedition on the mountain is a very involved multi-week experience. I'm sure many of you have been there and know that. A common progression is to spend the first week or so of the climb reaching basin camp at 14,000 feet, a second week roughly acclimatizing at base camp and advancing to 17,200 feet, the high camp, and the third and final week at high camp waiting for weather and strength permitting for an attempt on the summit. One other unique aspect of a climb on Denali bears mention. Because of the heavy, heavily glaciated and then technical aspects of the climb, Climbers manage the risks of the mountain environment by connecting to each other via rope for the entire route. And this is a significant and a major difference from climbing in greater ranges elsewhere on the planet, where access to the route generally does not involve a week or more of glacier travel. Practically speaking, always traveling roped with appropriate spacing means that for the great majority of the travel day, climbers only talk or touch base with teammates when drawn together in a safe zone free of hazards. Roped travel is a lonely affair. And although success on the West Buttress is absolutely a team effort, many hours are spent traveling on the route with only the sound of the wind and the staccato of snow as company. Travis Haskin from Kenai, Alaska. Travis holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering. He spent his post Denali time working as an outdoor guide in Juneau. Travis is currently traveling in the Mountain West. He will return to Juneau in the spring and work as an assistant instructor in a variety of our courses. Going into the Denali trip, I wouldn't say that I was cocky, but I was definitely confident that I would be one of the ones standing up at the top of the mountain. I felt that I had all the skills necessary to make it. Um, I also felt that I was one of the stronger persons in the group. I had plenty of physical endurance built up through my two years of wildland firefighting. 
I had enough nights spent in the miserable cold down in Wyoming, up in Alaska, at 20 below. And this is before I even learned about, well, going through the ODS program, about proper gear management. And to quote Colby Combs, one of the foremost authorities of Climate Denali and the owner and operator of Alaska Mountaineering School, you don't climb up Denali, you camp up it. And I felt that I had all of my cooking and camping systems down. I, I could set up a tent in no time flat and was really good at uh, being able to light the stoves, which could have been one of the most difficult tasks if you end up burning down the cook tent. But through all of this history, I was fairly confident that I would be one of the ones standing up at the top of the mountain. Flying into Denali was amazing, and the first couple of days were fairly mellow. Um, the first day was a gradual hike uh, from base camp up to the base of Ski Hill. And second days, we ended up carrying up and uh, got caught up in a little bit of a storm, but nothing that really tested our abilities. I mean, we just kept on hiking. But it was the third night that... I started getting headaches, and from that point on, they really didn't let up. Uh, we made our way up to 11 camp the next day, and still the headaches persisted. I, I remember writing in my journal just very briefly that, yeah, I, I was starting to be in pain. Then, I believe it was on the fifth day, uh, we went down to grab the gear that we had stashed, it's a back carry day, and it's supposed to be like a active rest day, or a short one where uh, it's not too physically strenuous, and we would be able to rest more at the end of the day. Well, we got down uh, to where our cash was at, and both Kevin and Forrest had been telling me that uh, the headaches sh should probably subside as I go down the mountain. As I went down, they were still bad, and... I, I was barely able to help out uh, digging out the cache because of the headaches. Then on the way up, they just started getting worse and worse. Uh, about an hour out of the cache, I, I, I just couldn't bear it anymore. Um, I, I dropped my knees and uh, yelled out a word for stop, which was car. And I was just in so much pain, I, I ended up being in the fetal position down on the snow. Um, Freddie came over and was kind of checking to see what was wrong with me, and I, I was just uh, welling up with tears, not so much out of the pain, but just because I was in that weak of a position. Um, the instructors uh, gave me some acetazolamide, which helped with the um, AMS, um, the acute mountain sickness, and the pain went down a little bit, but I, I was still in a world of hurt at that point on the mountain. And going up to 11 camp, I, I was pretty weak. I uh, ended up being at the back of the pack, uh, everyone just kind of making sure that I was all right. And I, I'm not used to being in that weak of a position. Finally, we made it up to 11 camp, and the headaches persisted, but then even late in the evening, I, I, more symptoms showed up. I, I started having a cough, and that persisted throughout the night where if I was anywhere but on my right side, I, I was just hacking and coughing through the night. Uh, my tent mates could not have been too happy about that. Uh, then in the morning, uh, all the instructors, Shay, Kevin, and Forrest, came into my tent and pretty much told me the news that I, I had been expecting, that I was the one, the first one that was going to be going down and out of the mountain because of the condition that I was in. Um, I, again, I, I was extremely emotional, uh, not wanting to leave the group that I had grown so close with over the past year. But... Eventually, we had a long breakfast, and I uh, started heading down the mountain with Shay. And it was an extremely slow process, even going downhill, just because of the state that I was in. I, I was in no shape to be moving, and uh, 
we were able to make it down to base camp that night. Uh, Shay spent the night with me, and then the next morning I flew out. And that was it for me, for Denali. Um, and I, I want to go back to the beginning where I said that I was confident in almost all matters of going up on this mountain. And I, I just want to say that Denali and this capstone experience was uh, an extremely humbling uh, experience for me. It showed me that you can't always prepare for everything and you aren't always going to succeed. Uh, no matter how confident you are going to be into it, it really taught me something that um, that there are amazing challenges out there and that through this ODS program, it really taught me that I have to be humble in endeavors that I go into in the future. Thank you, and Travis, if you're listening right now, we look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs> Samantha Becker, from Wasilla, Alaska. Sammy is a UA scholar. She spent her post in alley time working in the outdoor industry here in Juneau. She's currently a student in our BA in Environmental Studies, emphasis in Geography and Outdoor Studies, as well as an assistant instructor in various Outdoor Studies courses. Climbing Denali was something I've dreamed of doing since I was little. Then it was just something that sounded super cool, because I was a child and didn't realize what climbing mountains really meant. I grew up with Denali in the background, literally being able to see it on clear days near my house. Its beauty and greatness could compel anyone to dream of what it would be like to stand on top. Planning and training for Denali encompassed my life. It seemed to follow me everywhere. I had never put so much effort and time into one thing, I had close to no real experience hiking or camping in cold weather, but the challenge of this mountain was captivating, and I wanted to test myself, see what I could do. Mentally preparing myself to spend close to a month with nothing but the supplies on my back was a much bigger challenge than physically putting one foot in front of the other on a snow-covered slope. I cannot even express the degree of nervousness I felt the few days before we flew into base camp. Going from sunny green Talkeetna to the 7,000 foot base camp looking up at Mount Hunter was intimidating to say the least. Our first few days were early days, and by the time we were moving gear to our cache at 9,800 feet, I already felt bogged down. 1,000 feet, I had a never ending headache and woke up every morning to a swollen face. Everything was uncomfortable on Denali. Walking was uncomfortable. Going to the bathroom, especially as a girl, was one of the most complicated things I had to do. <laughs> I had never experienced that degree of exhaustion. Just taking care of myself, like walking to the latrine, seemed to use up all of my energy. Climbing this mountain was the hardest thing I've done in my li life, but through the ODS program, I have learned that mountaineering is about embracing all that the natural world can throw at you, even if it puts you in the most misery and pain you have ever experienced. This is what I did on Denali. I respected the mountain for all of its power, and I felt privileged just to be there. I wasn't just up there on a guided trip, with a bunch of people I had never met before, paying thousands of dollars hoping I would come out with a picture of me on the top. It was so much more than that. Climbing with the people I did made the climb worth it. I don't think that I would have been able to pull the trip off without my teammates. And one of the hardest things I faced on the mountain was Travis getting sick and having to go down. Travis was the one person who never once doubted my capabilities of performing on the mountain. If I was ever unsure of anything, Travis would, would back me up. 
When Travis broke down on the trail while we were heading back up to the 11,000 foot camp, I was in complete shock. Travis does not break down. Travis can do anything. I cannot comprehend how Travis could be in so much pain and I not. AMS is not something you can control, but I still never thought I would witness it to the degree I did when Travis left. After his departure, the game seemed to change and the consequences of climbing mountains became a little more real. That next day, we made our carry with gear to 13,500 for a cache. This day was exhausting. I was pretty distraught from Travis leaving and couldn't help thinking of how different it was without him. Our packs were heavy, the sun was blazing, and the slope seemed to be never ending. Yet no matter how much I thought I wasn't going to make it, when we finally did, there was such an immense feeling of accomplishment every time I got higher. At 14,000, the view is spectacular. The immenseness of the Alaska range seems only to be multiplied from here. On the day that we were making our cache on the ridge from 14,000, I had a gut feeling that I wasn't going to make it. There was so much going through my head that it is really hard to convey what exactly made me turn around. But at around 15,000 feet, Acacia and I both decided that it would be the farthest we would go. So we turned around and headed back down to camp at 14,000. Two days later, the rest of the team left and Acacia and I just hung out at 14. The day spent here, Acacia and I didn't talk much about our decision, and even today, I still feel as though I haven't reflected much on my choice. Acacia and I had, and still have, a very intimate relationship. Our time spent together on the mountain is unlike anything I have ever experienced with anyone else, and it's hard to think of what it would have been like to not turn around with her at 15,000. Coming down the mountain was tough. Everyone was ready to get back but it was a long time before we got there. Finally seeing base camp was such a relief. Yet when we were flying out in the plane, the summit seemed to be glowing and I couldn't stop looking back, thinking about my decision and wondering what it would have been like to be on the top. Even though there is still a part of me that, that thinks about what would have happened if I had not turned around, at the same time, I still see the climb as the busy biggest success of my life so far and I cannot wait for my second attempt at the summit in 2012. Acacia Edmiston is from Maryville, Tennessee. She came to UAS on National Student Exchange from her home, University of Tennessee, where she is currently completing a Bachelor of Science in Psychology. Acacia spent her post alley time working as a paddling guide in the mountains of Tennessee and will be returning to Juneau to work as an assistant instructor for the upcoming sea kayaking course this fall. Hi, my name is Acacia, um, and as Ford said, I'm from Tennessee, and climbing Denali was something that I had never even dreamed of doing. It was honestly too big for me to even comprehend. I remember at the beginning of the school year, we were just throwing around um, capstone ideas, and jokingly, McKinley came up, and then it just kept coming up in conversations and meetings, and before long, it was actually a real possibility. And as we begin training for this overwhelmingly enormous task in front of us, I began to understand just how big of an endeavor we were attempting. Preparation literally consumed my life for a good four months. Training for something like this where you have absolutely no basis for what you're doing was really challenging. I had only used snowshoes a couple of times and had only seen more than about three inches of snow um, about five months prior. Every workout I would be doing, I'd be like, am I doing enough? Well, are you strong enough? Am I going to be able to make it? I've never really devoted so much of my time to one specific endeavor. And then there were so, still so many unknowns that you can't prepare for. I knew it was going to be hard, but I had no real way of like mentally preparing myself for a month out on a mountain. Um, it's a really strange progression to go from Tennessee to climbing the tallest mountain in North America in just 10 short months. Um, but I did feel 
really well technically prepared for the climb, and that had a lot to do with the classes that we've been taking and everything we've been involved in. But I remember getting to base camp that first day at 7,000, which that morning we had been in such a rush to get everything on the planes and get out there just to try to beat the weather um, that when I watched our plane take off and I watched our only real link to the outside world take off, it was all really overwhelming. I'd never even seen the Alaska Range before, and now I was stuck in the middle of the Calhoun Glacier. I remember looking over at Sammy, and I was just like, what the heck am I doing here? No amount of training could have prepared me fully for what was what was before me in the next three weeks. The first day of hiking was actually one of the hardest for me. We all had these ridiculously heavy loads, and we're plotting for hours across this never-ending glacier, gaining no real elevation. The whole time we were walking, I was questioning my motivation, my sanity, my will to live, really. Um, this was all, so when we were still getting all our systems down, um, who knew that going to the bathroom on a rope team without taking off your climbing harness, all while wearing gloves, would be so time-consuming and challenging. Needless to say, by the end of that first day, I was spent, and there were still all the little things I had to get done, like setting up tents and boiling water and making a bathroom and cooking dinner. Simply taking care of yourself became a huge chore, and you still knew that you had another two and a half weeks of this to get through. There's no real way to know how your body is going to react and respond to altitude until you're actually there. I knew all the symptoms and was prepared for a little headache or a little nausea, but when it actually hits you on top of your already exhausted state, it can be a real blow to your already waning motivation. I was feeling pretty good through our move day up to 11,000, and then I got hit pretty hard with nausea and headaches and sleepless nights. This all takes a real toll on you emotionally, and then in those days, um, Following Travis's collapse on the trail, those were some of the hardest for me mentally because I wasn't feeling really well either. And then I see Travis, and Travis could do anything. I was sure he could have sprinted his way up to the top of that mountain. So when you see someone of his physicality coughing his lungs up in your tent all night, it's a real eye-opener. Um, Travis having to go down was one of the hardest things that I dealt with. Um, I was climbing with the people that I'd spent every day with for the past nine months, and all of a sudden he wasn't going to be there. It was just a real blow, I think, to everybody's mental psyche. The next day after Travis left, we went to cash at 13.6, and this was definitely another one of those really hard days. Everyone had a lot of gear they had to get up, um, and I was really starting to feel the effects of altitude at this time. And those hills just never seemed to end. I would look at what I still had left to climb in front of me and be like, there's no way I'm going to make it up this. But then somehow, some way, you just keep going and you make it. And then every day, I fin like every day I finished, I was like, this is such a huge accomplishment. Um, and then once we were all at... 14,000. I was pretty elated. It was so good to have Shay back and then our whole group back together. And the views up there weren't too bad either. This was the most gorgeous place I had ever been. I still couldn't believe how vast everything was. Um, it was just breathtaking and enormous. And then in the next few days, um, me and Sammy made a pretty tough decision not to continue up the mountain to the summit, and then stayed together there at 14. I couldn't imagine climbing without her. And we had a lot of fun and met some really interesting people while we were stuck there, but we were definitely ready to head down once the guys got back from the top. I still, like, wonder and kind of regret how far I could have actually pushed myself, but at the time, I definitely think it was the right decision. Um... And then the hike out was one of the most brutal nights of my life. We were all exhausted and just ready to be back, um, back in Talkeetna, and it was cold and windy and long, and I was peeling skin off my toes. It was definitely not my finest moment as a mountaineer or as a person. Um, but once we did arrive back at base camp, 
Everything had turned into a beautiful morning, and we could see the whole Alaska range and the flat out. That was the first time that I had ever seen the mountain in its entirety, and it literally took my breath away. I think that was probably the moment that I knew I wanted to go back and give it another try. Um, climbing has evolved a lot for me in a really short period of time. It went from being this unfathomable thing to actually something achievable. Um, and the summit was never really my age for success on the trip. I was experiencing everything for the first time, and I really couldn't have asked for a better trip. Climbing with your best friends and not only still liking them when you get down, but actually having grown closer is a big statement for our group and how much we accomplished on not only this trip, but throughout the whole year. Um, and I can't wait for my second attempt on the mountain with these guys in 2012. Acacia, we miss you. We'll see you soon. Kevin Cry. Kevin is an associate professor of philosophy and the academic director of outdoor studies here at the University of Alaska. He couldn't be here tonight because he is at a conference overseas, but deserves specific recognition beyond his support and leadership on our Denali capstone for development 10 years ago of this outdoor program and its interdisciplinary nature. He is the, the real brains behind our certificate in outdoor skills and leadership. And Kevin spent his post-Denali time working on philosophy of sport, his, his particular discipline. He is the editor of a recently released, excuse me, recently published Climbing Philosophy for Everyone, which happens to be shortlisted for the 2010 Boardman Tasker Prize for Mountain Literature. It's a very significant thing for us. In addition to teaching at the university, Kevin is a lead guide and co-owner of a extreme skiing operation here in Juneau. And he would have liked to be here tonight. And there's a photo of Kevin and myself on top of Motorcycle Hill. Enjoying the view. Father and son wall in the background, and the hanging glacier is the Upper Peters, which you can, if you've looked at the map on Denali or have been up there, the uh, glacier you see when you get up to Denali Pass. So obviously we're still 6,000 feet below that, but it all connects. Alfredo Munoz from Yakutat, Alaska. Freddie came to Alaska as a teenager from San Angelo, Texas, flatland country. He was visiting a relative in Yakutat and was inspired by the landscape and the people to relocate, live, and study in Alaska. Freddie spent his post in alley time working for the Alaska Department of Fishing Game in Yakutat and also catching the swell. He is a surfer. At the university now, Freddie is working on a BA in Environmental Studies and Geography. He's also a key employee at the University of Alaska Southeast Recreation Center.
All right, hello, my name is Freddie Munoz, and I would like to talk to you tonight about my humbling experience on Summit Day climbing Denali, what went through my mind, and how that day unfolded for me. And I'll start with that morning. It was a beautiful sunny day, the weather cleared up, the wind died down, and my headache from the altitude finally went away after taking Diamox the day before. I had been eating and resting well, and I felt like I was in great condition. Earlier on the mountain, I was really worried about acclimatizing, and so now I felt as though I had acclimatized well and felt ready to reach the summit of the mountain that day. We began to get ready around 6 a.m., and I was really nervous at this point. It was the final day, summit day. We'd been climbing for so many days, and now it was gonna come down to a couple of hours. I was nervous and confident at the same time. I felt like I'd gotten this far to 17,000 feet, and all I had to do was just a little bit more to get to the summit. So we all gathered our gear together, roped in, and we all looked and stopped and decided that we weren't gonna wear our big parkas because the sun was out and the wind wasn't that bad. So we decided to settle for our lighter down jackets. But I did decide that I was gonna wear my high altitude mittens with hand warmers and my overboots with toe warmers inside. So we took one final look before heading off. Forrest had a talk with us so that we all understood the severity of making mistakes at this point, that it's not worth losing our fingers or toes. We needed to be smart about this. That was a great moment. That way we had our mindset on what our true goal was, to make sure that no one got hurt. I just wanted to see how far I could push myself mentally and physically without sacrificing my safety or the group safety. And so we began up the Autobahn. And as soon as we started, there was a group behind us that seemed to be right on our tail. We started to go into a shaded area where the temperature was much lower than what it was in the sun, and I felt the drop in temperature. I began to get very cold, and the wind began to pick up. All the while, I had been trying to keep constant movement in my toes and fingers in order to keep blood flowing. Finally, it just hit me. It was just so I was just so completely spent. I was freezing and more exhausted than I'd ever been before in my life. I just couldn't feel my fingertips anymore, no matter how hard I tried to wiggle them. I began to get worried and nervous, and so I yelled up to the front explaining how I was losing feeling in my fingers. We all agreed, since there was a group behind us and we were on a pretty steep section, that the best thing to do would be to continue up the Autobahn until we were in a safer location. That way, the group behind us could go around. This point was the hardest point on the mountain for me. It was like hell. I was in so much pain, I felt like throwing up and crying at the same time. It was one of the lowest points in my life. When I got up to the top, I couldn't feel my fingers. Forrest asked me to take off my mitts. Four of my fingertips were white, which is an early sign of frostbite. Forrest, Shay, and Yosuke all helped me get my mitts, puffy pants, and parka on. At this point, I gave it one last shot and started moving my arms around to get circulation back. My hands felt like giant ice blocks. I couldn't zip up my parka. I couldn't put my puffy pants on. I couldn't open my water bottle. All the basic things you need to be able to do on the mountain. I wasn't able to do. And so that was a huge point for me on the trip. It was a point where I had to accept the fact that I was going to go down after coming so close. I asked Shay if he could take a photo of me at the highest point. So me and Yosuke took a photo together. Watching Shay take my photo was very upsetting and it was too much to hold back the tears. I realized that they were gonna keep going and that I had to head down. On the way down, I really didn't talk too much to Kevin, and I think he understood that I really wasn't in the best mood. But the more I thought about it, I was really proud of myself because the things got very scary and very real, and I felt like, as a group, we made the right decision. I had just started climbing last year, and now I was at 18,400 feet, something I thought I would never do. It was a very sad moment, but at the same time, it was very exciting. I was healthy and I was gonna be okay. In the end, I have no regrets. I went up and I gave it my best shot and I'm very proud of myself and the group.
Climbing this mountain took so many sacrifices and complete dedication for a year, and I wouldn't change that for a thing. I learned that it's not all about climbing the mountain or reaching the top. It's more about the journey and the lessons of life you learn along the way, the friendships that grow stronger, and the amazing memories you make. It was a life-changing trip, and I wouldn't have traded it for anything in the world, and I can't wait to continue climbing around the world. Shay Michael Mack is uh, officially the assistant rec center manager at the University of Alaska Southeast. He works for our outdoor program as an adjunct instructor in both of our primary skills, uh, paddling and climbing. And I count him as a friend. Shay hails from Northern California. He's worked professionally in the Mountain West, throughout North America really, focused in the Mountain West in the Baja Peninsula of Mexico and California. Shay joined our Denali expedition as an unpaid volunteer to support our students. And his efforts yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shay. And Shay's efforts made the success and sustainability of this expedition possible. All right. You know, I had never really considered climbing Denali until I was asked to join this trip. As a young college student in Colorado, I had attempted several 14ers with some success and much failure. I was no stranger to the mountains. Ice climbing in Ure and Silverton had made me strong in cold conditions. After college, I climbed Mount Rainier and went to Peru to trek in the Andes. It was there that my confidence was shaken and I had all but given up on high altitude mountaineering. I guess I wasn't meant to be an alpinist, I thought. Moving to Alaska, Denali wasn't even on my radar. I remember stories of friends in college suffering in the snow, slogging through waist deep powder, ferrying load after load of gear, trying to get further up the mountain. And to what purpose, really? Why would someone want to do that? If there was one thing that spurred me to join this trip, it was just that purpose. It was the will and the strength of the five students that really gave this trip meaning. From early on, it was their intent to climb Denali. As hard as I tried to encourage them to think about something more realistic, <laughs> perhaps more reasonable or closer to home, the more their conviction held. They were truly set on climbing Denali. In order for me to be involved, I felt I needed a reason to be there. As their manager uh, at the rec center and as an instructor at, in the ODS program, I had grown quite close to this group of students. I understood their drive to reach for their goals. I remember pitching an idea as an undergrad for an expedition to Bolivia and can still feel the rejection when the trip fell through from lack of funding. It takes something unique for a group to tackle a trip that is larger than anything they've ever seen, tried, or experienced before. So if they were going to the Denali, I was going to do everything in my power to support them. So 
So as a volunteer instructor, my primary role was to be there to support for both the students and the other instructors. My previous experience in the mountains and cold environments had taught me how to take care of myself. I knew what I could handle. On Denali, the technical aspects and route are straightforward. Essentially, you're just snow camping your way up to the top, hoping for a break in the weather to make your move. Once you put aside the cold, the weather, the time it takes, and the difficulties along the way, climbing in the mountains is real simple. <laughs> Keep yourself warm, rested, hydrated, and well-fed. It's living at its most simplistic form. Logistically, it sounded feasible, right? I knew the effects that altitude could have on a climber. And from years of guiding, I knew how to take care of people. But I didn't know Denali. I was going into the Alaska Range for the first time. And to me, that was both scary and exciting. An old climbing anecdote that I'd heard is that the Himalayas are the training ground for Denali. Or maybe that's vice versa, I can't remember. <laughs> Regardless, it was going to be no small feat. Harder than anything any of them had attempted before. Or me, for that matter, really. But their confidence and drive was inspiring. I went into the trip not thinking about the summit at all. My role was to support the group, keep everyone safe, and make sure everybody comes home. There was some comfort in that. This wasn't my trip after all, it was theirs. And there was some relief in not having the pressure of the summit on my mind. Obviously, when you're climbing a big mountain, you want to get to the top. But a part of me was genuinely worried that I couldn't do it, that my body would fail me like it had done in the past. It's not a fear you want to admit to, but it was there nonetheless. I felt really strong throughout the entire trip until the summit. Even after taking Travis down and returning solo to the group at 11, I felt in great shape. On summit day, I was the last climber on the rope, and I was feeling confident. After we reached Denali Pass, and it was determined that Freddie wouldn't be going any further, I figured that I would be headed down. That was my role, my purpose on the trip. When Kevin opted to take Freddie down, I had an unexpected shot at the summit. And that decision really surprised me. I had to switch back to a summit mentality and get ready to go. It turned out to be one of the hardest days of my life. I wasn't ready. I was a mess. I struggled to get ready. In the gusty wind, I put my insulated pants on backwards. I didn't eat a snack like I usually did. I roped up behind Forrest and Yosuke and just went along for the ride. It took me two hours to catch my breath. I devoured as many snacks as I could, drank all my water, and laid my head down to rest. I was worked. Exhausted, I kept telling myself in my head that I would unrope and stop right here while Forrest and Yosuke headed, down to the, headed to the summit. I never vocalized it out loud, but it replayed in my head for hours over and over again. We were climbing the tallest peep in, peak in North America, and I was ready to go give up. What was going on? The mountain was clearly getting the best of me. Doubts crept into my head. Perhaps I wasn't as fit as I thought I was. Or perhaps I had used up all my reserves earlier on the mountain. But I think somewhere deep within my subconscious, I was a, that there was a blockage from past defeats trying to hold me back. Clearly, I was in a losing battle. About an hour from the summit, I finally took control of the situation. I could sense that I was going to make it. I started feeling better. My camera batteries had died. I pulled out the video camera and let it roll. The views were spectacular. I started to get pretty choked up. Nearing Yosuke and Forest on the summit, I was in tears, and I could see that Yosuke was too. It was totally unexpected for, unexpected for me to be at the top, but there I was. In the tent back at 17 camp, I reflected with Forrest and Kevin. Both of them had summited before, but this was my first. In a sense, I was much like the students climbing Denali for the first time. Summing, summiting 
brought about a newfound sense of accomplishment and pride that I hadn't felt in a long time. I started talking about other mountains I wanted to do, heading back to the Andes, climbing elsewhere. The confidence I lost long ago had returned. Denali had shown me that I, was, that I could still persevere in the mountains and elsewhere. Yosuke Sano from Shizuoka, Japan. <laughs> Came to UAS in Alaska in 2008 because of his love of wild places and of photography. Yosuke returned to Japan over winter break of last year and focused all of his time on mountaineering and returned to UAS last spring and focused all of his energy on this upcoming Denali climb. Yosuke is currently working on a, a BA in Environmental Studies and Geography. And I'll turn it over to you. The reason why <coughs> I climb mountains comes from photography. I have been photographing for five years since I graduated high school and bought my first camera. I took a lot of pictures of people, buildings, night views, and I found that taking pictures of nature and wildlife attracted me a lot. Especially, I wanted to take pictures of amazing views, which most people have never seen before. Then I started to climb mountains with my camera. Three years ago, I worked at Mount Fuji, the highest mountain in Japan, and also a mountain that I saw every day from my house and climbed many times since I was 10. I worked at a lodge at 10,000 feet, provided food and place to sleep for climbers. I worked up the mountains for a month I met many great people, saw amazing sunsets, sunrises, and shiny stars. Through the experience, I became interested in living and working in the mountains. But I didn't have any skills and knowledge of outdoor skills, outdoor sports. So I decided to transfer from State University of New York to University of, of Alaska Southeast to learn outdoor skills and leadership. I knew a little bit about Mount McKinley. It is the highest mountain in North America and one of the seven summits. I was interested in climbing big mountains because I wanted to take pictures of amazing views, which most people have never seen before and most people can't see them in their life. Also, I wanted to challenge something big in my college life, so climbing Denali was the best choice for me as a capstone trip. At the end of fall semester 2009, we decided to climb Denali. During winter break, I went back to Japan and spent most of my time climbing mountains since I had no experience of winter camping and climbing. During the spring semester, our team spent a lot of time practicing skills that we needed to climb. We gathered information and planned for the trip. Also, we read a lot of reports about accidents that happened when people climbed high mountains, including Denali. So my fear increased as I learned more about the mountains. Also, in southeast Alaska, you are not able to experience extreme cold and high altitude. So my goal was to get to the top, but I didn't have any confidence to say that. I told myself to do my best Go high, mas go high as much as I can and take beautiful pictures. When we left Juno, I had 80% fear and 20% excitement. <laughs> <laughs> when we flew to the mountain, I was still nervous, but 
But as we went higher, my fear, my fear gradually went away and my excitement increased. Nothing special happened for me, to me for the first couple of days, but Travis had to leave on day five. That shocked me and every one of us, since he was one of the strongest people in the group and also was a leader since he, we met him. After he left, I realized that anything can happen on the mountains. So I promised myself that I should be more strong and healthy. At the 14,000 feet camp, some of the members felt and were struggling with high altitude. I didn't have any symptoms, so I told myself to be healthier and stronger and support members and also for myself to go higher. My fear was gone at this point. I really was enjoying climbing every moment on the mountains. And I started to feel that I wanted to go higher and higher and see what would happen next. Also this time, I started to have a hope and a little bit of confidence to go to the top. When we got to 17,000 feet camp, I still didn't have any symptoms of acute mountain sickness, but air was very thin, so it was always hard to, hard to do anything, even build a tent and make a snow wall. We had a rest day before summit day at the 17,000 feet camp. Even walking was not easy things to do, so we walk around the camp and take pictures of amazing views to climatize. I had 50% of excitement and 50% fear. <laughs> <laughs> On the summit day in the morning, my mind was almost empty. I had 10% of fear and 10% excitement, and other 80% was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I prayed to the mountain to calm my mind, told myself to go, and wished we would all come back safely, and we left the camp. Three hours passed since we left from high camp. Freddie and Kevin had to leave from the group. Then Forrest, Shay, and me. I really wanted to get to the top for members and myself. We walked seven hours very slowly, like one step in every five seconds. My mind was still calm and empty. When we get to the bridge around 5 p.m., about 10 climbers came down from the summit and we shook hands and then they encouraged me and said, congratulations, you are almost there. That was one of the best moments from the trip. Then around 6 p.m., Forrest, Shay, and I got to the top. I cried and remembered what I have done for this trip. But as soon as we get to the top, strong wind and clouds came and covered the summit. We, we moved to the safe place and took some shots and went down to 17,000 feet camp. We were on the summit just five minutes and couldn't see the view from the top. So I couldn't believe that I actually made it to the top after 17 days. <laughs> what I have learned from this trip is if you have a dream or something you want to achieve, plan to achieve the goal very well and find out what you need to do and practice. Then your dream come true. One year ago, I climbed Denali my friend, who is a guide and strong climber, climbed the Denali and couldn't make it. Before I took the ODS program here, climbing Denali was a dream, but I had no confidence to climb. But through, OD through the ODS program, we planned very well, found what I and we needed to work on, and practiced and worked hard for eight months, and my dream came true. My next goal, is to tell people what I have learned from this trip and make them experience it. I wasn't interested in guiding before climbing Denali, but now I want to tell and share with people what I have learned and what you feel when you achieve your dream. Also, I want to continue my adventures. I want to climb big mountains and take pictures of amazing views and share with family and friends 
I also want to climb Denali again as solo because I want to plan and prepare everything by myself and apply what I have learned from ODS program and from this trip. And also, I couldn't take pictures of amazing views from the top, <laughs> so I want to climb Denali again. <laughs> that is my next goal. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to say thank you very much for our amazing instructors, members, families, and people who shared our adventure with us. Thank you very much. Almost there. Yosuke and Forrest climbing the last part of the summit. It's looking awesome up here. Top. I can't fucking believe it. To conclude, Henry David Thoreau, writing in 1862 in his piece, Walking, wrote that in wildness is the preservation of the world. Our endeavor, climbing Denali, the ODS capstone of May 2010, was an effort in wildness. I believe the summit of a mountain is often an anticlimax. That much of the value of any venture is the journey and not the conclusion. Perhaps this is the same humanist argument that describes life as both comedy and tragedy, painfully, joyfully real. This is not to say that I don't love standing on top of mountains. I do. But in reflecting on the efforts of our ODS Denali, I return to the journey, to the uncertainty, to the fact that 
all expedition members returned safely and that those that did not reach the top rather than feel defeated feel empowered empowered to return to attempt again a climb to the rooftop of North America to embrace once again the uncertainty the wildness and the exhilaration that can only be reached by total commitment. Thank you. So this, the panelists are willing to take questions. We ask that if you um, do have them, uh, or if you need to go, this will be a good time to, to go. But if you, if you do have questions, that you wait at least for the microphone to come so that people online and on television can hear your question. Test, test. Okay, I, I have a question. Uh, a lot of the people who had to go down talked about the, one of the difficulties was the, the amount of weight that had to be carried. 145 pounds and so on. In retrospect, can you think of anything that you could have done without? I'll turn that over to my team members. Well, before, before we went on the trip, uh, we had so many meetings and you know it seemed like we were meeting every week and we always went over what was necessary what we didn't need what we did need and so we did so much planning and everything that we did have in our packs was necessary it's a lot of food it's a lot of equipment a lot of gear and yeah basically everything we had we had planned for it and I don't think we could have done without it so that sorry <laughs> a lot of the time uh, on these bigger expeditions you're going in pretty heavy with food and you're establishing yourself at whatever the advanced base camp is in this instance the Janae Basin and then from there the loads are much lighter but anytime you've got these big loads and you're traveling on a glacier you're using a sled so you can divide the weight in half and I would like to think that we can climb the mountain with less than 120 pounds per person, but that seems to be the average if you talk to the, uh, the uh, air carriers that take expeditions in. So 120 to 145, some gets left at base camp as your cash in case someone needs to come out, and most of the weight is food and fuel at that point. Uh, the climbing equipment's gonna really top out around 60 pounds at most. I mean, it's, it's a lot of puffy insulation items, crampons, Helmet, on your necks, and you know some specific uh, climbing equipment. But a route like the West Buttress is is climbed so often; it's a trade route that you don't need a whole lot of gear. So it's mostly food and fuel. Yeah, I have a I have a question. I've always heard that the distinction of the Alaskan mountains is that they. Um, have some of the deepest, if not the deepest, snowfall on the planet. I've heard this, but I've never had it really verified. So um, I'm just kind of wondering where Denali sits as far as average snowfall in for its elevation globally. 
and also um, where it actually sits uh, as far as high peaks of the planet. Is Aaron Hood here? <laughs> so I can't speak to the annual precipitation, the snow loading on Denali. It's significant because it's so high. It's always snowing above probably 9,000 feet now. And that line used to be lower, but the climate is changing. And uh, the way that's affecting the Alaska Range and the big glaciers, such as the Calhitna coming off of Denali, we have areas that used to have year-round snow begin to actually get into some seasonal, some summer season type rain events when the, the clouds come. It's no, no longer always dropping snow. Um, as far as where Denali sits in the pantheon of greater ranges and larger mountains, it's, it's relatively small. There's um, over 100 mountains of similar height and possibly over 200, uh, 6,000 meter peaks in the world. It is the tallest in North America and in the Andes, there are a handful of 6,000 meter peaks and one peak that's just touching 7,000 meters, almost 23,000, but it's really not until we get to the Himalayas where uh, the, the Himalayas are the, just from a scale standpoint, the most amazing mountain range on Earth and have 14, 8,000 meter peaks and the ones you're probably familiar with, of course, Everest, but maybe K2 and some of these others like Annapurna or Dalagiri. Those mountains are, broadly speaking, six to 9,000 feet in vertical elevation higher than Denali. But as pointed out in the slideshow, Denali is the furthest north of any large mountain in the world. And high altitude actually starts, depending on who you talk to, at 4,000 or 6,000 or 8,000 or 10,000 feet. I mean, we're at high altitude when we're in Denver and athletes go and train at, at six and then notice at eight or even higher that they're not able to gain as much out of their aerobic capacity because it's just too high and their body's not uh, responding in a kind of long-term benefit way. But uh, uh, where Denali sits in the subarctic affects its feeling of altitude and Having been higher, I it feels like a 7,000 meter peak, and I, uh, certainly that's a commonly noted um, feeling. There's no real way to prove it, but the way the upper stratosphere works, and again, this isn't my field, the, the jet stream is pushing over the mountain and affects the pressure above 14,000 feet and even after at 14,000 feet, and you can see it on your barometer, on your uh, altimeter watch where it'll go from being 14 to all of a sudden it's reading 16 or 17,000 feet and so you have a dramatically higher often on clear high pressure days uh, feeling of altitude than the actual vertical measurement of the mountain so but regardless it's a high mountain you you notice that when we're when we're walking up the thing it is quite slow and I've always counted myself lucky that I don't deal with many of those AMS symptoms that our students were talking about, but that's not to say that it's easy. It, it's not. It's, it's a very dry air. There's always this kind of, yeah, every, every as Shea pointed out in his uh, narrative, there is a lot of basic maintenance that takes up the entire day. And so it's, it's certainly not a high mountain by the world standards. It is the h highest mountain in North America. And and the Western Hemisphere it remains high. And I think it's probably, to conclude that question, worth noting that many climbers from around the world travel to climb Denali because of its place latitudinally, because of its massive glaciation. And I think also probably because of its striking beauty. It's a beautiful mountain. Yeah, I wonder if um, more time spent acclimatizing would have helped the folks with the mountain sickness, and are you limited to the amount of time you can acclimatize because of the supplies you have to bring in? <laughs> um, yeah, you can spend more time, but um, then you are going to have to bring more food and more fuel. So the more time you want to spend, the more weight you're going to have, which is so. But yeah, 
Um, when I go, I'll probably like go a little bit longer than we did. Um, just to spend a little bit more time so I make sure I feel better. So I make sure I'm ready for the push to the top. The <laughs> and there's more. <laughs> so the common adage is no more than 3,000 feet in a day or 1,000 meters. And often on these mountains where we've got these big loads, we're taking a, a, a load up and then coming back down. So we gain some elevation and then sleep at a lower ele elevation, which is another common adage, climb high, sleep low. And our acclimatization strategy was fairly standard. We didn't skip any camps or advance in any particularly fast manner. It's really Structurally, it's just really hard to do that because you've got all this stuff. I mean, if we had had equipment at 14, then you start asking yourselves different questions. Can we just single carry, for example, up to 14 and get there in whatever it takes us day by day rather than moving up the glacier, dropping supplies, moving back, sleeping, moving up the glacier, dropping supplies. And so it's a, it's a hopscotch effect. In the instance with Travis, we had stashed equipment on a carry day at 9,000 feet and then traveled back down to 78 and slept, the base of Ski Hill, and then moved past our equipment up to 11, the standard camp, but still within that 3,000 meters. Obviously, we'd been to nine before, or 3,000 feet, excuse me. And then the following day, back carried, which he alludes to in his narrative, where it, that was just where he collapsed. And clearly, there were more advanced acute mountain sickness symptoms going on, and uh, serious cause for concern, not something I've seen present that way before. Travis had HAPE, high altitude pulmonary edema, and if he had not gone down, he would have been in serious trouble. And so that's, that's why his departure from the expedition was a really critical juncture for us. Obviously, he needed to go down, and that's potentially the end of the trip. For all of us, certainly for him, no question. And, and we needed Shay to come back. So a lot of things happened in that first week that could have ended this effort. And there's a certain amount of luck that goes into all of this and, and a belief in good things or things just working out. And, and for us, it came together and worked out. Can I ask one question? Oh, there's some here. I think Freddie mentioned taking Diamox in response to melt, uh, altitude sickness. Did any of you take it prophylactically, and um, and if not, would you do it on your next attempt? No, no, that's that's <laughs> preventively. Yeah. So I'll just talk about my experience with it, and um, I felt pretty well on the mountain, you know. I noticed that Travis, it hit Travis pretty hard, and Sammy and Acacia, and me and Yosuke were just looking at each other, like, we're just waiting for the altitude maybe to hit us, and at 17,000, it hit me really hard, and so, um, yeah, I took Diamox, and we took a rest day, and like I said, I woke up the next day, and I felt great, and everything, but yeah, I, it just affects everybody different, and like, I don't know, I don't, Sammy, when did you take it? I never took it. Yeah. Um, starting around 11,000, I would wake up with, to like a swollen face and swollen hands from peripheral edema. Um, and at 11,000, Forrest and Kevin and Shay and I talked and I could have started to take Diamox. Um, but I think there's, there's just something about not taking it and just like being in the mountain, just like with you and, and your body and not like putting stuff into your system and just like trying to just let your body like react. And um, that's kind of what I wanted to do. And when I go back, no, I don't, I don't plan on taking it prior to being up there. If it starts to get bad and I really wanna take it just to see how I affect to the drug and to see if it does make me feel better, I, I'll consider it, I'll, I'll bring it with me, but I don't plan on taking it prior to the symptoms. Diamox is acetazolamide, it's a sulfa drug, and it doesn't cloak acute mountain sickness symptoms. Mild symptoms are 
um, nausea, headache, some dizziness, ataxia, lack of sleep. Um, and it's a lot like taking an ibuprofen or something like that, right? It's not, it's not a steroid that's going to help your brain stop swelling and potentially save your life. But there are some high-altitude drugs out there that are in the med kits that climbers take sometimes because it's emergency and sometimes in popular climbing literature because they're, they're dexin for the summit or something like that. And that's not Diamox. Um, Diamox taken prophylactically is no longer the medical protocol that, that we generally work with in the program or that I see in, in, the, in the trade. And the research is based on um, Peter Hackett and his work at 14 on Denali from 81 to 89 and then continued um, research at high altitude in Colorado since then. And so the standard, the standard dose is 125 milligrams sometimes have clients with 500 milligram tabs. The side effects are tingly fingers. It's a diuretic, so you pee a lot. And so obviously that's not great if you're dehydrating yourself while you're trying to stay hydrated and acclimatized, because that's the sure way to avoid a headache. Everybody knows that, right? Drink water while you start taking Diamox, and all your water's flowing through you, and pretty soon people are peeing constantly and walking around with tingly fingers and all kinds of strange things seem to happen. So we use Diamox on a, on a fairly minimal level and prophylactically not anymore. Uh, certainly there are lots of doctors that might uh, look at the, the very large, well, it's actually pretty slim, I think, compared to a bunch of other medical research, high altitude. Medicine is a young field, but it seems like the best is preventative and as a way to acclimatize. If a climber never feels better, up to four times a day, but not a very mar large amount. 125 milligrams is, is pretty small, right? Standard ibuprofen is 250, and using it as a tool. But and I I climbed an alley with my dad, um, and he he was pretty nervous, and he went to see his PA and got this this like jumbo diamox, and so it and it didn't really it didn't really help him. He had that super hydration effect at some levels and then at some other levels it, it definitely helped him sleep and helped him get to um, his high point and I think feel good up there feel better and so I, I uh, I'm in favor of Diamox but I don't generally see it taken prophylactically and actually get people higher on mountains yeah uh, you mentioned in your in your talk Yosuke, about um, Juno not having extreme cold or extreme altitude, but I was wondering what your all's training regime was leading up to the trip. Training up to that. Well. I can tell you from experience, um, Yosuke was the guy with the backpack walking around the valley. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I think a lot of these guys and gals, they spent, um, you know, occasion, Sammy would load up their backpacks with 50 pounds and go run on the treadmill and climb stairs and do that for an hour, you know, and uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Freddie was uh, involved with cycling class and I'm not sure what I did. Um, not much, but um, <laughs> I think it varied for everyone, you know, like we were out a lot in class, you know, we were out in the mountains uh, hiking around with heavy packs anyway, so it was sort of part of the routine, you know, part of the routine. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, we didn't have the option of just walking out the backyard and you know, going to high altitude and, and spending a lot of time on glaciers or um, working our way up into higher mountains. You know, Juno, it's a mild climate here in the southeast. You know, there's not a lot of, um, you know, maybe if we headed up into the Takus and, you know, but really we're pretty low elevation, you know, 5,000, 7,000 foot peaks around here, so. month progression we're <laughs> we're moving from 
day outings on the weekends this time of year to multi-day outings, expedition-based outings that are four or five days long in the spring. But because it is this intensive nine-month program, students are working through 15 academic credits a semester, and they, they need to be here at least four days of the, of the school week. And because of that, we're limited from access to the ice field, which is really our extreme cold venue here. Right? I mean, we can go up on Dean Peak. We can touch it. We're certainly working on the Mendenhall quite a bit in the spring semester with all of our climbing classes. But it's really not, um, it's really not a multi-week experience until you're on the capstone. And that's, that's, that's the intent. And so on some levels, uh, and, and that's just structurally what we're limited to. So on some levels, the capstone is really this capstone. We're putting people in an entirely, this uh, entirely new environment. And so we have the ice field, and towers are 7,000 feet, Devil's Paws, 85. But we're not really going to be able to get over and, and climb in the fair weathers or get up anywhere where it's, it's really going to become noticeable. Travis getting struck down at 11 is unusual, but people die at 11 from altitude, so it's, it's not unheard of. And so a, lar a large part of it is just the, the flow of how the curriculum kind of has to work with foundational classes, building to more advanced classes, building to multi-day classes, building to this multi-week experience. OK. Um, like I said, um, I was going back to Japan. Um, after um, we decided to climb Denali, and I worried about high altitude and uh, coldness. So um, what I did was um, I slept uh, in my garden outside with my tent, and <laughs> and um, I climbed uh, highest mountain in Japan in winter. It was just uh, 12,000 feet, but um, it was high and cold. So um, I went there with my friend, and um, I uh, almost got the first bite right here, but uh, that was through practice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the last question, and I'll make it a quick one. And a sort of self-serving one is I, I teach English here, and I'm slowly integrating into the outdoor studies faculty. Uh, I, I sort of want to know what's next. This seems like a pretty big project. Can you, can you top this? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't necessarily want to top it. It's not. <laughs> but next is uh, maybe a Brooks Range, maybe yeah, maybe a long sea kayak. Well, maybe. <laughs> well, and I w so we're limited by the that same kind of flow. We need to have the right mountain, the right big mountain. There are other big mountains in Alaska that are appropriate for our group with their skill level. The Wrangles have large volcanoes, Sanford, uh, Bona. Um, maybe Blackburn, a little more technically difficult. But So maybe a big mountain, not Denali. <laughs> and the really exciting thing I think to share is that we recently acquired a set of pack rafts. So we're going to we're going to climb something probably and then pack raft out of there. And, and one of the trips on the table involves pack rafting through Anwar and then flying out of Kaktubik. So that would be not necessarily topping the highest point in North America, but certainly <laughs> an equal trip of, of four weeks and very intensive in the planning and preparation and very, very remote. And touching on that wildness theme again, that one really resonates with wildness for me. Of course, can I add that, you know, we, we have a new group of students, new, new ideas, um, so <laughs> a new adventure. Oh, yeah. uh, well, I'm from Illinois, from Springfield, Illinois, so I don't really get any of this awesomeness down there. So I really want to do something extreme, like go to the Brooks Range and climb and, and whatnot, Cause because I've never been able to experience anything like this program anywhere near me. So, yeah, I want to do something pretty, pretty awesome. Well, uh, yeah, thanks, everybody, for the and thanks for coming out.